seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform for the occasion. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. As, and as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a sacred day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. The kind of emergency that scientists say is made much more likely and more damaging by climate change. The total number of claims that have been filed since the beginning of the pandemic to 41 million. LA. The milestone, 100,000. Americans from all walks of life, across generations. Earlier today, just a few blocks away, there was looting underway nearby. Police seem to have had enough. Morning. How you guys doing? So glad to see you. We're finishing up our series, Law and Order, and we got some great uh, stuff we're going to step into uh, over the next couple weeks. Make sure, uh, again, on September 20th, uh, on count of three, I want you to shout September 20th. I want you to type it in, okay? Just write, you know what? Just write 920, not 911. That's bad, right? 920. All right. On September 20th, you shout September 20th on the count of three. One, two, three. Very good. Remember, that Shine Sunday. We'll have a lot of details for you next week. Something special, something exciting. You're going to want to be there. Uh, in between then and now, guess what? Uh, Pastor Lewis is going to be back uh, uh, in a couple weeks. And no, he's not going to scold you for being white or anything like that. He's got an amazing message, uh, a ministry God's put on his heart. I went down and spent some time with him uh, uh, in Fort Wayne this week. And I am so excited about what he's doing and what God has put on his heart I mean, we're going to be blessed just to hear about uh, what the Holy Spirit is doing through Lou and Pastor Lewis, and, and I can't wait. So I hope you get excited about that. I'm excited. I am excited to see you. I am excited to see you. We're all excited to be here. I said in the first service, the first two songs been sang. I heard them this morning. I was out praying, looking at the stars. God's majestic. I did not feel a tear or a thing. I didn't feel an emotion move. I didn't feel like raising my hands or speaking in tongues or anything like that. I was just like, that's a song. Do, 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 do. But there's something about gathering with, with other believers. Whether you're online, we're spirit and truth, or you're right here with us, there's something that changes everything that happens. Amen? Because when God's people get together, the light shines brighter. And whether you're online shining or you're in this room shining, we're going to shine, 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 because we go out and put light in dark places. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let's get started. As we end this, I want to recap because I started thinking about, you know, like a series is supposed to be like four to six uh, messages. And I got to be honest with you guys, uh, I, I, I did a little fact checking kind of, and uh, we've been doing this for like four months. So I'm sure you guys are sick of the dun dun and everything like that. It was clever and funny at first, and now it's just like, shut up, Ben. All right, look, 
<laughs> I think it's important you know the history of what's going on before we get into where I feel God is leading us, okay? The Old Testament, listen to me, look at me right here. The Old Testament is the inspired word of God. When uh, Paul tells Timothy in the New Testament, which you love to quote, okay, it's like, all scriptures God breathed. I want you to remember something, okay? He wasn't talking about his letters. He was talking about the Old Testament. He just happened to be talking about his letters at the time. But I don't think he was like, I am so awesome. I am writing scripture right now. Although that would have been very powerful, wouldn't it? You know what I mean? Like, wouldn't you love online to know your fingers are inspired? What would you write? What would you text? What would you tweet? That would be amazing. Okay, like, and so I want us to know that history and kind of how it all ends before we move uh, into the Gospels and the New Testament and Jesus. Uh, and what we have seen, we started uh, with the prophet Jeremiah, actually. And the prophet Jeremiah had come to Israel as Israel's met its final destruction. The whole kingdom is, is coming down to the end. They're being overtacked by the Babylonians and King Nebuchadnezzar. And, and, they, and they, these people, just, they just won't listen. The world is, look at me right here, right here, okay? Look at me. The world was literally falling apart around God people. And the prophet Jeremiah was talking to them. And you know what they kept saying? Oh, peace, peace. God will save us. Grace, grace. Just what we like to say, right? Don't worry about it. We're just going to keep on sinning. It's going to be okay. And Jeremiah kept looking at him and he kept saying, repent, repent or you're going to go to time out. You're going to go into exile. And finally, he gives him that judgment. He gives him that word. I just sped up all the way through Jeremiah 1 to Jeremiah 29. And he goes and he speaks to him as they're going to exile. And the world is falling apart around him. Guys, I don't have to paint. You know what I love? I don't have to illustrate the world is falling apart anymore. Like, I don't have to tell any of those stories. I was in jail. This dude, you know what I mean? Like, I don't have to talk about that. The world gets worse every Sunday I get here. So I want you to hear what I'm saying right now. The world is getting worse, just like it was upon them. And he kept looking at his people saying, repent, and finally, they're going away to exile. Time out means you lose your land. You lose everything. But yet, in God's amazing grace, giving them what they don't deserve, in their love, the prophet comes and he speaks over them, and he tells them this. He says, for 70 years, you're going to go live in this land, but you're not going to stop living a lot of us have been in exile, haven't we? We lose a friend, we lose a spouse, we lose a job. We sit all alone by ourselves. We feel like we're in exile. And these people know for 70 years we're going to go sit in exile. But I love what he says. You're going to keep on living. You're going to keep building houses. You're going to keep having babies. You're going to keep doing your job. You're not going to stop living. And I feel like I just got to tell everybody in this room right now, whatever exile you feel like you're in on camera, whatever exile you feel like you're in, keep on living. Because he doesn't just tell them to keep building houses, doing their job, ha getting married and having babies. No, no, no. He tells them more than that. He starts saying, I have a plan for you. And I have a purpose. And that plan and purpose is good. It's good for you. It'll prosper you. It's not to harm you. It's for good. But you will seek me. You will find me when you seek me with all your heart. And you know what 70 years had to be? I think 70 years may have just been a foreshadowing of getting the religion out of them because for the Jews, you can't just go personally seek God. It's not like what we think as evangelicals today, like we come to church and we have a personal relationship with Jesus. We, it wasn't like that. You went to the temple, you needed the priest to oversee the slaughter and all these things that went on. And for them to be in exile and God to come to them and say, you're going to find me when you seek me, this would have been revolutionary. In time out, We'll personally see God, and that's what happens. And for 70 years, they shake and bake in the oven, and they sit in exile, and the world changes. Get a new emperor, no longer Nebuchadnezzar, now comes King Cyrus, the Persians. And one of the first decrees this King Cyrus says, 
It says, release the people to go back and build their temple. This is unreal. These people don't, they don't deserve this, but they get to go back and now they get to go put law and order in a destroyed land because that's what their land was. Their land had been ransacked. The walls were burnt down. Walls were super important because walls were protection, okay? Uh, I love the proverb that says, a man uh, without self-control is like a city without walls, okay? It's, walls are what we have to protect us. They have no walls to protect them. Their land has been overrun. They just nothing has worked. They got a few of their, you know, comrades left. They don't, you know, now they've become like third, fourth, fifth, sixth cousins, and they don't talk the same language. I mean, everything is jacked up, but now they've been called back with purpose because now they've seen God. Now they've lived in exile, and they've gotten stronger, and they go back, and their job is to restore law and order. And in that land that's chaotic, so is our land. It's chaotic, and it's what I want us to see. And so the first two people that go back in the book of Ezra are a guy with an awesome name, Zerubbabel. If we had another child, I would name him Zerubbabel. Notice I said him. If it was a her, I would name her Zerubbabel. Okay, <laughs> that's what I would do. And you've got a priest named Joshua, okay? Because remember, this is all important. I know you guys are like, this is nerd stuff and boring. No, it's not, okay? Super important. They didn't have a president and Congress and all that. It was a theocracy. So you had like a governor figure, which would have been Zerubbabel, and you had a high priest, and you had Joshua. And they're going back to restore the law and order in their tore up land. And so they go back, and the big thing that they do, if you remember, is they build the foundation, and they have a huge party right? They've done a big Jesus thing. You guys have ever been a part of a big Jesus thing? I have. I love it. I still talk about those things. When I know I encountered the living God, and I do believe it can happen through that camera, and I do believe it can happen here, and they have it when the foundation of the temple is built, and then all of a sudden oppression comes, and it stops. It stops. And then God raises up two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. And their message is simple. See, they stopped building this foundation for years. They walked by and like, remember that moment? Remember that moment? Remember that Jesus thing we did? That was awesome. You know what I mean? Like maybe one day, maybe one day. Haggai says it's st- it, one day is here. One day is enough. Stop worrying, and what his message is, is stop worrying about building pretty houses. Stop worrying about trying to do things on your own because you know you're unfulfilled in doing it. And get up here and restore the law. And that's what they do. They turn their attention back to Jesus. Because sometimes we can get off track. Amen? Amen. All right? So they get back. They rebuild the temple, and here comes shiny Sheriff Ezra. And Ezra finally drops on the scene. Don't you think it's funny in the book of Ezra, you got to get like seven, eight chapters in before you even see this cat? And he's only there for like two. I call him a humble man. And that's what I loved about Ezra, the shiny sheriff who was really kind of a Barney Fife, but that's what we connect with, right? You know, you want to be with somebody, you know, not who's right, but someone who's real, and that's who Ezra is, and he's there to restore the law, and the law gets restored, and just at about that time, you hear all of a sudden this guy, Nehemiah, and Nehemiah has woke up with this passion to rebuild the walls, and remember, the walls bring order, so you've got the law, God's word going out, you've got order going out, And where we are in Nehemiah chapter 8 is what I want you to hear right now. Because if we want to see the kingdom of God literally change the world, I mean, stop stupid politics. I mean, stop garbage on TV. I mean, stop seeing people miserable. Stop people living in addiction. Stop marriages falling apart. Stop garbage going out everywhere and affecting our children. If you want to see it, stop. And you want to have that resolve to restore, then look in right now. Because here's the deal. They got all the right pieces. They got the temple, they got the law, they got the leaders, and they got the walls. All the right pieces are in place on the checkerboard. Everything's ready. And I think back in March, Christianity probably felt like they had all the pieces in the right place, on the checkerboard. I mean, we're putting out all these magazines, music, and buildings, and na, 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 na. And I'm not talking about uh, you. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about Christianity, Christendom. I want to show you, when I was preaching about this, I thought about 
something that happened at my last church, okay? So all the way back in the aughts, the first service knew what an aught was, like back in aught six, aught seven, you know what I mean? We were uh, at uh, my last church I served in, and um, you guys remember that, uh, what was that, uh, Extreme Home Makeover? You, you, you guys remember that show? Okay, so somebody in our area won and was getting a new house, okay? Uh, I don't know. You can Google it online if you want and check it out. The guy was super good looking, and I, I really don't care about DIY stuff. So <laughs> Kristen's the man of our home when it comes to that. Like, I wasn't interested. And uh, uh, you, the idea was, I think, you go in and, like, flip a house for somebody who needs, you know, help or something like that. You restore a house. Yeah, that's, that was why I was thinking, okay, you restore a house. So, anyway, uh, the, the contractor who was hired to do the job for the TV show went to our church. And so, guess what? Well, they need tons of help. They need camera hands. They need people to pull trash. They need all that. So, they get up on a Sunday morning and they say, hey, we got a chance to put light in dark places. We got a chance to be on Extreme Makeover. And if you want to help, just sign up. And I'll tell you what, 95% of the people signed up for that request to go build a pretty house to be on TV. If I stood up and said, you can share the word of God and change the landscape of the world 15 years ago by investing in our children, I get a 2% return. But when I say you can get up and be on the TV camera for maybe three seconds hauling some trash, oh, I'm there. Oh, I'm there. Because you get something out of it? Pathetic. You know what I like to say in the aughts? Let's think 15 years later. Let's think about those five-year-olds. Those five-year-olds are the ones burning down cities. It's not liberal policy. Shut up. It is not training our children up in the way of the Lord. That's the problem. Now you can look at all this second-tier stuff, and that's fine. I don't want to get into politics with you. That's not the point. The point is, is why do we invest 2% in what matters instead of 95% in pieces that will fall apart. No one's going to remember if you were there two minutes before the Charmin Man commercial. No one will. I will. The only reason I remember it is because I remember being brokenhearted that that many people would sign up to put together a fancy place and then all fall away. Then all fall away. And when I look at the state of the church in the world today, one-third is what they believe of people who are actively attending on a Sunday are gone. Now, they, they don't tune in. Okay, I didn't pay Pastor Nathan. Eric and I are like, oh my gosh, Nate's going off. You know what I mean? Like, we didn't pay him to share that. To what he was like, share it, share it, share it. Why? Light, dark places. Why? So, when this stuff starts to happen and, and this pandemic starts going on, I start to ask myself, okay, if the state of the church, one-third, are just they won't even tune in. They won't even turn it on for three seconds. Were they really ever the church? Is it really a bad thing that this is going on? I mean, I don't want people to die. I don't want you to get, okay, like Scott knows firsthand. That's not what I'm saying. But if God can work all things for good to those who are called according to his will and purpose. I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for saying this. Look, I, I want those one-third to come back and hear Jesus, and that's what we're asking you to do that. But maybe he's raising up his people and spreading the wheat from the tares right now. And maybe we're ready to go restore because we see a broken world. Because I don't want the state of the church to be a place that says, I want to sign up to get something out of it. I want us to say, I want to sign up to invest in changing the world. I want us to have the discernment. I want us to have the wisdom. I want us to have the readiness, the equip, the heart, the fire, and the spirit to go with us to change the world. And I think, just because you've got some masks on doesn't mean all the pieces aren't in place. I think sometimes the best battlefield is not what you have, it's what you can see. And I see darkness, and I see light. These people in Israel, they got the extreme home makeover. But these people also have what I think is the restored resolve 
to change the world. And I want us to look at that for just one minute. What is it about these people that truly has this heart to go change the world? And I want it to challenge us for just a minute today. It's not very long, I promise you. First thing I want you to see is this, okay? Pick up in chap chapter 8, verse 1, Erica had read. All the people came together as one. On the count of three, I want you to shout one. Count of three, I want you to type in one. One, two, three. One. One more time. One, two, three. One. One, two, three. One. Together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring it to the, the uh, Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. Now, this is going to be super important. Why am I so worried about one word? And the word is one. There's a play on words for you. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. <laughs> because we view the number one very differently, right? I was talking to earlier, it's like, oh, well, sometimes I feel exiled because I'm alone, because I'm one. And we all know this song, one is the loneliest number that you have. You know, I know this song, right? That's why we know we're not trying to get attention with numbers online, because I can't sing. We see one is a bad. We know that when, when Adam was in the Garden of Eden, right, God said it is not good for what? Man to be alone. And then he said, women will be fine, man, not so much. No. <laughs> you can type in amen if you're a female. No, 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 no. No, no, no. One here is super important. I want you to hear what one is. See, what I had to skip over to get out the message I felt God laid me to share through this is even at one point when Nehemiah comes back, he finds out that the people have become corrupt. They have been like withstoring, uh, the governor particularly, had been withstoring all the food and holding it back. And then, catch this, okay? Some of the Jews were enslaving their own people. It was a corrupt system. Oh, we can, we can all identify with that, can't we? So Nehemiah doesn't just go out and rebuild, restore the walls. He goes out and restores the swamp. And he tears it all up. And all of a sudden, when they come together as one, they're not coming together as a, a, a certain type of politician, a certain type of wealth, a certain type of uh, limitation on them, uh, like uh, the biggest one. Oh, catch this. If you're an Old Testament scholar, you, you've been to church for a while. Notice it does not say they came together as this tribe, the tribe of Judah, this tribe, the tribe of Benjamin, this tribe, the tribe of Simeon, this tribe. It doesn't say that. But if you go back, how many of those boring genealogies did we skip in Ezra and Nehemiah that kept going back to all these types of people. Priests, Levites, it kept breaking them down. But this time, it doesn't say all of them. It says one. They all came together as one. They didn't come together as Baptists. They didn't come together as Pentecostals. Church of God, Methodist, Lutheran, Catholic, Anglican, I don't know. They didn't come together like that. They didn't come together as rich or poor. They didn't come together as I'm from Benjamin and I'm from Judah. All these labels they could have put on, they came together as one. And I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. Hear me now if you want to see this resolve. Coming together as one ain't as easy as you think. We had the whole what? DNC last week. And this week we got a whole RMC. And the next week, I hope we get a whole week of run DMC because we sure deserve it after that, don't we? Amen. Amen. Yeah, hallelujah. We need something to, to lighten the mood. Good Lord. I got a D. I got an R. Well, guess what? I got a libertarian. I'm, by, I'm the only one that's right. I'm the green party. I'm going to go marry a tree. I, I, you know, you're like, what, what is going on? And we all slip into it. And we put it on. Hey, Christians, we do it, right? We say, I'm a what? Baptist. I'm a what? Lutheran. I'm a what? I don't know. I go to the church of God where the weird guy goes. I, <laughs> look, I am not one of those people that's like, abominations are abominations. You know that. You know how many backgrounds come here and we all worship in spirit. And online here, you know I do not care about that. But listen to me. The Baptist or whatever, Pentecostal, Methodist, whatever, that's an adjective that describes the noun. The noun is a Christian. 
Don't put your adjective before your name, your noun. That's right. Don't identify with the DNC. You be Laura, you be. Be a child of God. So hard. We got marriages that aren't one. We got families with kids. They ain't one. You got people at your job. You ain't one. Do you like being alone and having strife? No. Well, guess what oneness takes? Humility. It takes brokenness. It's those who race for the bottom, not for the top. I don't live in a world to be right. Now, my wife would argue with that. I think I've argued that with a few people. People are like, yeah, don't get no argument with Ben. I, mean, <laughs> I truly try not to. I try to find common ground because I know there's power in one. But we live in a world, guys, I haven't even touched the mask issue yet. We all know your uncle who has an opinion on the mask. We all know somebody at your job who's got an opinion on the mask. I pretty much know all of yours, okay? <laughs> we just feel like we just got to say. We just got to say. And you know what? I don't care. I don't think it's a bad thing to talk about your opinions. What is bad is when I get a three-page manifesto taped to the door on Sunday ranting about how I'm leading you in a satanic way by allowing you to wear masks or asking you out of love, who doesn't, I don't know if you know, if you know me, then come talk to me. Come talk to me. Please, but don't do this. This is not helping. You know, I went from hating you to loving you, and it hurt because I want to be one with you. And I don't know who you are, but the world ain't against you. God is for you. So stop dividing people. And let's go back and let's, you know, just think about our words for just one minute today. Did you say something divisive? In your home, with your kids, with your spouse? If we said something divisive, then let it do this right now. Look, look right here. Then let it break you. Let it convict you. Because I did it. Because you aren't going to get the next part. You won't get it. If you want to get something before you come out of here, then stop and think about it right now. What did you do to not maintain oneness? So they've restored order because everybody's one. Now, here's what they also did. They restored the law. It's like we said. Pick up in verse 2. So the, on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. There you go again. We, he read it out loud from daybreak till noon and has faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of law even Leviticus. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them, and in he opened it. The people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands, and they responded, amen, amen. And then they bowed down, and they worshiped the Lord with their faces on the ground. I just, I got to pull this out, okay? I got to pull this thing out. Check these folks out. They come out. They aren't in a fancy building. They don't have cushy chairs. They don't even have pews. Come on, young people. They don't have that. They go out in the weather, whether it's rain, sun, sun, shine, muggy. I don't know. Maybe it was a perfect day. You go, well, Ben, you, you're imputing the weather. Fine. I'll make it a, a perfectly 69 degree sunny day where you can choose to wear a sweatshirt or a t-shirt. You know, you do what you want. Let's say it was that. But they did this from daybreak till noon. You think I'm windy at 30 minutes. You tune me off at 19. Everybody was like, the best thing that ever happened was everything was locked down and you were pre-recorded because Nate had me on a clock. <laughs> 30 minutes, we're editing. 22 is the goal. 
And then all of a sudden, we're <laughs> back in restore lawn order. He's like, he's back to 44. You know what I mean? Like, there we go. These, okay, daybreak. So I come in about 6 o'clock, about 6.15, the sun rose. What time is it now? 10.57? 10:50, so for another hour. So from 6.15 this morning, and for another hour, these people sat out and listened what? Attentively. They didn't check their phones. They didn't write back and forth to anybody. They didn't, you know, write notes back and forth. They didn't play games. They didn't play tic-tac-toe. Hey, watch. They didn't go to another page. They didn't do any of that. They listened attentively to what? The book of the law for possibly six hours. Have you read Leviticus? Have you ever noticed how, you know, Exodus and Deuteronomy almost sound the same? And you're like, Pastor Ben, is this a contradiction? Because somebody came to my work, I'm like, you ever notice some of that? And then you got to wrestle with miracles and things all on top of that. And yet they're out there listening, attending for six hours. So shut up about 40 minutes. Six hours. My goodness. I could go six hours, but I won't. I have an appointment at noon. <laughs> I want you to see this. So, all right, just so you get the idea of where they are. Now I want you to check this out. So Ezra stands up on what? A high platform. And he opens the book of the law. And all the people did what? There you go, Ben. There you go, Erica. There you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. You're getting it. You're getting it. He stands up and just opens it. Why? Because it's the what? Living word of God. Stand up at home right now. No one thinks you're weird, except us. Stand up. He just opens up the book. And he prays the Lord, the great God. Praise the Lord, great God. And all the people went, what? Oh, I'm sure they did it that enthusiastically. It's, <laughs> type it in louder than they can say it. They did what? Amen. 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 And then they bowed down, so push the chairs away. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they pushed the ch they, they bowed down and worshiped the Lord on their faces. They don't have comfy chairs. Chances are they got kids talking out loud wherever they are. They got people with diabetes. They're like, I got to eat. My blood sugar is getting low. That might be a real thing. Let me back up for all the positions. All right, like, I'm lactose intolerant. I don't know. Make something up. Well, I don't know what that had to do with that. They don't need to. It's just back up. Anyway, so they're out there. They don't got little league. They ain't worried about what's going on in life. And when they open this book, not only do they shout, amen, amen, they don't go, oh, I put on my church clothes today. I can't get down on the ground. They got down on the ground with their faces. You know what that means? It means I can't even look at you. I can't even look at you. Do you know the brokenness that that would take? The respect, if somebody just picked it up, and people would shout out, amen, amen, and fall down. You don't hear somebody going, I got arthritis. They just got down and worshiped God on their face. They got in the dirt. Why? Check it out. This is exactly why. Check it out. Next one. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them, All, this, is, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep for all the people who have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and then send them to those who have nothing prepared. The, this day is holy to our Lord. Don't grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And then the Levites calmed the people down saying, be still for this, day, this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away and they ate and they drank to send portions of food to celebrate with all great joy because now, 
Everybody say now. Now. They now understood the words that had been made known to them. The words made known to them. Now I want you to understand something. Your Bible did not just fall out pff, Old Testament, New Testament. It didn't happen. Matter of fact, the Old Testament didn't come out all at once. You had, these folks had, the book of the law, which we call uh, Torah, Pentateuch, or just Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's what they had. And you have to understand, at the very beginning, it said, the book of the law for who? Israel. Now, I don't care what denomination you come from. Any scholar, they don't even have to be a Christian, will tell you this. The book of Deuteronomy is written specifically like any Near Eastern contract would have been set up that day. So you're like, why does New Deuteronomy keep repeating some of the stuff in Exodus? That's why. Because it is a contract a promise between God and his people about he will be with them if they obey him. And if they don't, then they will be punished. It is a promise he is making. And so these people aren't just hearing a long sermon. These people are hearing the contract a loving God made with them and how they had failed. That's why you see them as one. That's why you see them bow down and fall because they knew the, the commitment, not that they had made, but their family had made, that generations before them had made, and they had failed, 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 failed. You ever hear some theologians say the law is like a mirror because it makes you look at yourself and see your sin. And when these people see a loving God who redeemed them, who gave them everything he promised, pick that mirror up and you still see your sin, you can't help but fall. You're not worried about the adjectives I was talking about earlier. You're not worried about shouting. You're not worried about falling. You're not worried about standing up or what you say, how you express it to Jesus. It doesn't matter when you know your brokenness in your humanity. And what would sting the most is that a loving God made a promise with them and they broke the promise. They broke the contract. Now, ironically, God definitely wanted me to show you this. As we're getting ready to move and we're starting to pull things out, you find treasures. And sometimes you find unfortunate things. This is a, a contract that I made with my loving wife. It's dated February 2nd, 2011. Just found this. It says, this is a formal love contract, binding for eternity, promising. Now it says after this, it's capital letters underscored. I will never. It's not inspired, but I just want you to shout it. On the count of three, I will never. One, two, three. I will never. That's a promise, right? As a contract, right? I'm putting it down. I don't even call her sugar mama, babe, honey. I like formally wrote her whole name out. I will never get another tattoo from this day forth, February 2nd, 2011. Benjamin H. Stuckey, with my signature, thank you, love you so much. I got about seven tattoos after that. <laughs> and, and when I saw it, I laughed, and I, and I showed Kristen, but here's the deal. All week I thought about that, that contract, right? Why would you write a contract unless there was meaning behind it? Why would you write a contract if you didn't need something? I mean, you sign a contract for a loan, right? Like a mortgage or a car. You sign a contract, a, an ethical contract, how you're going to act, all these things. Why? Because there's some type of need. And in my home, at that time, I wasn't even one with my spouse. Remember all the way at the beginning about being one? At some point, I had stirred up a hornet's nest so much that I truly felt, probably inspired after my prayer time, to go out and write some type of love contract to say, I will never tattoo myself again. Anybody who's seen me, got, there's a whole lot under here, okay? I broke the contract. I broke the contract with the one person that should mean the most to me. Next to, next to Jesus, I broke that contract. All I was probably doing was trying to get something out of it, right? Calm down the storms in my life, make her happy and stop nagging. 
You all know what that feels like. Come on, if you're married. And I even got Jesus black belt jujitsu on this bad boy. And I broke my word to my babe. How much is my word really worth? Remember the beginning I was telling you about everybody signed up, right? To do a thing where they got attention, to do a thing where they made life better for a minute. That was nothing more than this. Nothing, that contract's nothing more than me signing up to be on Extreme Home Makeover. How much is my word really worth in a promise? That's what I start asking myself this week. How much is my word worth? Because here's what I want to tell you. In Ecclesiastes 5.5, 5, as Solomon's coming to the end of his life, Solomon says something profound. He said, it is better to not make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. What does it say? If you ain't going to keep your promise, then don't make the promise. If you're not going to make a contract or fulfill the contract, then don't do the contract. Israel is now looking at hundreds of years of just constant breaking the contract out of spite, anger, and hard-heartedness. Now, let me put that to you one more time. If you should not make a promise you cannot keep, I want you to hear this, because God makes another promise later on in history for you, you, and me. And as Jesus is about to go to the cross to fulfill that blood contract, and he's in the upper room, he says this in Luke 22. He says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant. It's a new promise, a new contract in my blood, which is poured out for who? You. I want you to say you on the count of three. Type in you on the count of three. One, two, three. You. It was typed for you, you, me, and them in the room. Jesus said, this is my new promise for you. Now, let me ask you this right now. If Jesus said you are to be dead to yourself, you are to be a living sacrifice, you are to walk by faith in the Son of God alone and not by sight. If you woke up this morning and were divisive, if you woke up and you weren't one with somebody, even in your thoughts, if it didn't come out of your mouth, we need to hit the ground. And if you aren't convicted by that, then you need to go to Jesus now. Because he made a promise. He made a contract for all of us that we'll have forgiveness, that we'll have eternal life, that we'll have this, his resurrection power with us, that he will always be with us to the end of days. He puts all these promises in the contract. All he says is, I want you to make a vow to follow me. So think about your vow. Think about the day you did. Jesus, I give my life to you. Jesus, I devote my life to you. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Did you make that vow? Maybe your vow first time was salvation. Maybe your vow is you woke up today and you're like, Ben, I'm an idiot like you. I broke the contract. Hey! That's why we have forgiveness in Christ Jesus. That's why we know that his God's word says what? If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you have not been living by faith today, if your life reflects the world more than it reflects the light, then maybe, just maybe, I want to ask you to do this right now. I want you to close your eyes because, listen, I am not preaching at you anything I have not put on my heart and on myself. And this has been a heavy message because I'm going to have to go home and live it. So close your eyes right now. And I promise I'll, I'll walk the same walk with you right now because when I see a Bible open, I don't fall. When I come in, I was telling you earlier, I can feel the presence sometimes when I'm in the presence of believers, but not enough to be broken by my one thing that I have broken the promise God made for me. I said, Jesus be the Lord of my life, and I got up and lived on my own. If you need to really hit the ground in some dirt, then why don't you just come up and, and, and pray at the altar. Pray online. Write in your sins. Confess them. That's why we are to confess our sins. Look, I have really disliked some people. I even did it yesterday. I, I bad-mouthed the person intentionally, intentionally, in front of my kids and to my family. 
Why did I do that? I, I, I'm selfish. I broke the contract. I felt sick as soon as I said it. If you don't feel sick by your sin, let's say this, maybe you haven't asked Jesus Christ into your life for the first time. I know when I'm sinning. I know it. Sometimes it's just too good for conviction, but conviction always catches up. I want us to be a broken people, not to shame you, not to shame you online. I want us to be so bright that the ends of the earth will see it. We are not going to stop supporting Lebanon. We are not going to stop supporting Africa. We're not going to stop supporting Honduras. We're not going to stop shining in the state. We're not going to stop shining in the county. We're not going to stop shining in our city, but we need to be one first. One with God, one with your family, one with us, and one out there so we can shine brighter than the S-U-N because we've got the S-O-N amongst us. So I want you to stand up right now and I want you to hear every word that Ben is singing right now because this is a request and a confession and a, a confession of sin and a confession of I want this. We want the Spirit of God to come down upon us. And I tell you this, you think confessing sin will make it dirty? No, confessing sin brings out light. So confess your words, your heart, and your meaning as you sing this song as we go to God if we broke our vow because of the promise He made. I know this. We have all the pieces in place. And you may be like, Ben, I got a mask on. The Word of God is, if it can cut through the body, it can cut through your mask. You may say, well, Ben, I can't go out here. I can't go out there. But you can still live. Stop saying what you can't and start focusing on what you can. He is with you always to the ends of it.
Thank you for allowing us to have the second chance to be broken and the third chance and the fourth chance. (laughs) All those chances, Lord. Just continue to work in our lives and change us and mold us to be more like you, to pour light. Thank you, Lord, for the moment to be here with you and just be in peace and not worry about anything else. Lord, thank you again. You are amazing, wonderful, awesome, powerful, and majestic. All I can say is hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Lord, I uh, echo what Ben said. It's in this awkwardness right now. I felt awkward when I met Kristen, the one I love the most, God. It was awkward because there was so much, so much good, so much to lose, so much to gain. And if you're still feeling it right now, if you're still with us, don't fight the awkwardness. Lean in. This is why I love God's word. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you confess it with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you made that confession, if you made that vow, and you've fallen short today, take courage, brothers and sisters. Take courage. Because God's word also tells us if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh God, I want to come to you now. And I want your spirit to breathe upon us so heavy, God, that when we walk out of here, we shine brighter than when we came in. Not because of any uh, note that was played, not because of any word I said, not because of anything Pastor Nathan said or, or, or Erica said, none of that. Only what you said, Jesus. Only your word is what matters. Only your word is what counts. Only your word is what moves in our hearts. Only your word is what gives us power. Only your word is what's going to cleanse the world. Only your word promises us that while you're in the world, the light is in the world. And I'm going to keep saying it, God. I'm going to keep preaching the vision. I'm going to keep preaching the mission. I'm going to make sure that we are always shining bright into others. I confess that to you. And I will continue to wake up. And I will continue to seek you. And the days I don't, forgive me, God, because I know that you have said you are going to continue to do a good work in me until the day of completion in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I ask that everyone in this room and everyone online take heart with that and get honest with you and get down with ourselves and say, break us, God, so we can see your spirit go, so we can see the light go into the dark world and we will see disciples made in this city, in the county, in the state, and in the world. I ask this in Jesus' name and online and in the room, everybody said what? Amen. Hey, raise your hands up. Today's going to be a great day because if you are ready to go shine, if you're ready to go move, just remember that what it takes is humility, what it takes is honesty. All the pieces are in place. We can be a people to restore not just the grass outside, not just the parking lot. We can restore the world. Don't tell me you live in the grange because Jesus came from Nazareth. You have his word. Let me share it with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine down upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord continue to look upon us all with favor. And may the Lord grant to us his peace. Go, everybody. Shine bright into others.